My name is Justin Gage, and you're tuned in to the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast with your host, Jason Woodbury. Well, now, meet me in the bottom. Bring me my rotted shoe. Welcome back to another episode of Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. Great to have you here with us. Our guest this week is Peter Garalnik. Uh, Peter Garalnik is the author of a tremendous new book called Looking to Get Lost, Adventures in Music and Writing. He's been writing about music for decades. He was there sort of at the birth of modern music journalism, and it was really tremendous to get into uh, a discussion about this book in which he he has these long essays about people like Ray Charles and Merle Haggard and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and, and Chuck Berry and other lesser sung folks. And uh, he really is, with this book, trying to zoom in on the, the idea of creativity and how these artists embody it and uh, kind of shine a light on the more personal angles of their stories. Uh, it was great to sit down with Peter. I really, really enjoyed this talk. It was a thrill for me as a big fan of his writing. Before we head into the episode, I want to remind you that the best way you can support Transmissions, which shares every Wednesday, wherever you get podcasts and on Aquarium Drunkard, is to rate, review, uh, subscribe in your pod app of choice. Let others know that they can do the same. And if you want to take your support a step further, you can find us over on Patreon. Just search Aquarium Drunkard. Buy heads, foreheads, help us keep making this thing. We really enjoy doing it. All right, let's head into my conversation with Peter Garalnik. Speak a little bit more on the other side. Well, now meet me in a bottle, babe. Bring me my ruddy shoe. Peter, thanks thanks so much for taking the time to join us here on the Aquarium Drunkard uh, Transmissions podcast. It's a real honor to have you. Well, it's great to be here, and I had to do it because I had to find out just what an Aquarium Drunkard's broadcast is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess, let me see, I should try to explain that. Uh, Aquarium Drunkard was founded by uh, Justin Gage, my, uh, my, my boss at Aquarium Drunkard. Uh, he founded yeah. it as a, uh, like a web journal in 2005. Wow. And uh, I believe that the uh, Aquarium Drunkard thing comes from a Wilco song. Uh, oh, cool. Okay. Well, that, yeah. see, then if I if I had been better acquainted, and I should have been because I used to see Wilco quite a bit, then I would have known right away, and maybe I wouldn't have been lured in like this. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we ha- I'm glad that we had the uh, the uh, I, we had the element of surprise and curiosity on our uh, on our end, you know, which is seems like that's what drives your work more than anything is curiosity. Yeah, no, no, I would say I would say definitely, you know, uh, you know, Marvin Gaye could be a stubborn kind of fella. I could be a curious kind of fella. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. I, I want to start off by asking you about the photo that appears on the on the cover of this book. That's you and and Bill Monroe, and he's showing you. Uh, your book, Looking to Get Lost, Adventures in Music and Writing. I think it's from 1980, and he's showing you this this refurbished mandolin, I believe. Uh, yeah, he had just, got, just gotten it back from the factory, and he was very excited. I mean, this was sort of the most, I shouldn't say it was the most animated he got, because he was very animated in his, in his conversation, his discussion about the importance of work, or even something like, I mean, I was amazed going back to it and sort of rewriting it and re- revisiting it, the extent to which... I'm not saying he he might have opened up with anybody, but when he talked about an instrumental like Land of Lincoln, which he had written, which I didn't know at all at the time, and he's describing how what drove it for him 
was uh, this vision of, yeah, I, I think it was of young Abe Lincoln as a lawyer in Springfield and, you know, how the people were, were on the streets and this sort of thing. It was just, it was very different than what I'd expected. But, but the picture was taken because I had gone there. I met him. Uh, well, we, I, th I think I met him at his office, which was, um, you know, not a trailer, but uh, uh, some kind of a mobile home. And, um, and then we went to lunch at this place he went to all the time. And uh, Russ Bernard, who was the editor publisher of Country Music Magazine, which is a great, great magazine, which I keep urging people to do an anthology of because they had such a terrific roster of writers. And this is the one. No, we went. We went on two trips. One, and another was to give Johnny Cash a special edition of the magazine, which was dedicated to him on some anniversary of his. And, and we went out to Hickory Lake, and Russ idolized Johnny Cash. But anyway, this time he had his camera along, and he took all these pictures in the uh, in the restaurant out there with the mandolin, and uh, he recorded the event. And as I said to him, I said, you know, nobody's going to buy be, be, be buying the book for the content. They're all going to buy the book for the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was it about that photo for you that was like, I want to, I want to put this on the cover of this book. This this book collects stuff that you've written, uh, some of its newer writing, obviously some of its uh, much older writing um, that you've reworked. But what what was it about that photo that spoke to you specifically? Well, for one thing, it was it was a good photo. <laughs> it was well shot. I mean, you can see other photos in the book, which I treasure. Uh, photos with Solomon Burke and uh, well, actually, I had a great photo with Solomon Burke, but somehow or other, this, uh, but but other photos uh, th that I've got which are out of focus and that kind of thing. But what was great about this was it sort of, it was you know like a picture of uh, you don't even I mean it, you wouldn't have to know it was me because it's taken from behind, but it's you know on the job, you know it's like work in progress that kind of thing, and it was sharply taken and Bill Monroe is engaged and he's showing his mandolin and it's sort of it's all about work it's all about what the adventure was and so i guess that was what it was and and the initial reaction uh, i sent it to michael peach and i knew we were going to use it susan marsh has designed all my books since 1979 since lost highway and we knew we were going to use it and i she didn't design the cover but she did a sort of mock-up of it and michael peach my editor and who's and my friend since 92 i mean we've he um he was very enthusiastic and he took it into marketing and they said, oh, I don't know, you know, nobody's going to know who the guy is. You, you know, we love Peter, but you can't see his face. And who cares anyway? <laughs> and, and then, you know, so the so Michael reported that to me. And the next thing, his next email was, that's the, that's the cover. We're definitely going to use it, which I knew anyway. And he knew. So, but it just, it was, it was uh, years ago when I wrote Sweet Soul Music, <clears throat> uh, I had a picture of, uh, Rufus Thomas under the marquee, under the Stax marquee, and this little kid beside him looking up at him. And that was with Harper and Rowe, which became Harper Collins. And the people there were saying, no, that doesn't make any sense. That's terrible. That's who's the little kid? I said, the little kid's the future. And, uh, you know, to me, I mean, we, we didn't, we stayed with that for a while. Susan, Susan Marsh designed that. But again, it, it was a picture that spoke volumes, I thought. It wasn't a picture memorializing superstardom or any kind it just was a picture that had something to do with what the book was about and that's what this book this this picture of bill monroe and me i, I wasn't trying to glorify me i don't think it does it's just other than you know uh, you yeah I you do you do look you do look cool in the photo that's that's worth saying you've got like a cool jacket on and uh you got sunglasses you look you look awesome so you do look cool in the book and on, on, on the cover of your book you know that's important too i imagine well, I don't know. I mean, I, there are other pictures where I don't think I look cool at all, but they were, I, for instance, I've got one picture of uh, me uh, interviewing uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry together. Little Richard may have been in, in the room, but he wasn't in the picture. And uh, this was in 2011 with, this, with uh, Fats Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard and uh, Chuck Berry. And I'm not, I'm not so taken with the, with the picture of me, but I just thought, man, this is a moment, you know, so how can you yeah. leave that? Well, that's so much of what this book does. Is it? Is it? It um. You, you you gather together these stories, and and as you look at it, you know these are some of the giants of American music. I mean, these are the these are the sort of these are the sort of foundational pillars as of, of what we now understand as you know rock and roll and country and blues and all this stuff. Um, you know, going back, 
in the intro, you you describe your willingness to sort of be an acolyte for the music you love. I think is the term that you use. And reading through these profiles about not, people, not, not just not just willingness, eagerness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this that was your primary sort of driving right, right. your driving force was that you wanted to get this you know, talk about this stuff and and looking at these profiles of people like you know Ray Charles and Howlin' Wolf and Tammy Wynette and Chuck Berry. I mean, that evangelism, it it seems like uh, that spark has never really left your writing. You've been writing about music for such a long time. How do you keep a hold of that eagerness that you referenced? How do you not get jaded, you know? Because uh, I read this stuff and it feels just as, like, taken with your subjects as, uh, you know, a, a, tw- a 21-year-old writer would be, you know? Well, no, I mean, I just want to be, I, sh- I should make one thing clear. I mean, the centerpiece of this book is a, a, a piece that I wrote exclusively for the book about Dick Curlis. Mm-hmm. And his importance is no less than Elvis Presley's say. I mean, in other words, it doesn't, many of the people I've written about over the years have been little known or virtually unknown at the time that I wrote about them. And yet their place is just as as great as the people who are known as superstars. I mean, my aim has never been to chronicle the stars. But to, mm-hmm. but essentially to 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 chronicle their creativity of all the people that I'm writing about. But I think the main thing in terms of and I I think this doesn't serve an image very well. I mean I think you know to go back to your cool uh, image, I think I'd be I, you know maybe I would have been better off or I would be better off if I just said you know acted sort of cool and removed and didn't and uh, didn't betray my enthusiasm so much. But my intention all along. My intention is to immerse myself in every single story. Every single story is different. It's to immerse myself realistically. It's starting out with the idea of celebrating the genius, the genius of someone like Merle Haggard, say, the genius of someone like Dick Curlis or Howlin' Wolf. But to do it realistically, to do it in language that isn't gushy, and to do it in language that's always respectful, but that doesn't, uh, you know, uh, hedge on the realistic conflicts that they, uh, you know, that they encounter. And I mean, I remember when I first mo- wrote about Charlie Rich in 1970. I met him in 70. The book came, Feel Like Going Home came out in 71. Mm-hmm. And I had liked him so much, him and his wife, Margaret Ann, who uh, readers should know are in the party in the prologue. <laughs> it's called Having a Party. And it's just my image of, you know, uh, it's sort of a stupid, que- it's a stupid question you get. Well, who would you have at the ideal party? Who would you have in your ideal s- city? And in a sense, I'm saying everybody. Yeah. I mean, but uh, but Charlie I, and Margaret Anna just was so knocked out by, and he was just nowhere at the time. I mean, his popularity, he hadn't, uh, he was playing at a uh, at an airport lounge, six shows a night, um, and uh, pretty down. But I just loved them. And when I wrote the story, and I t- wrote about what he had spoken of as the story, which was, you know, his alcoholism, his agoraphobia, the fact that he really didn't enjoy performing. He was so uh, he was scared off, in a sense, by the audience. Uh, his mixed feelings about his career and his the guilt that he felt over leaving the church, or at least going against the teaching. And I, I wrote about him, and I thought, man, I don't know this is terrible. I'll never see him again. And he called up uh, after the book came out, which is a very rare occasion. He hated the telephone. I mean, in all the years I knew him, which was 25 years, he rarely used the phone. He called up and he said, you know, well, you ordered, I think, 30 copies of the book from the publisher. And then he called up and he said, you know, it hurt. It hurt. You know, there was a difficult thing to read, but it was the truth. And that's what matters. And that was what Dick Curlis, uh, I mean, the writing the Dick Curlis chapter was one of the hardest things I've ever done. But what, the last time I saw him, he says, you've got to tell the story. You've got to tell the whole story. And that's what I tried to do. And that doesn't mean you succeed and it doesn't mean you do the right thing. But I feel like I wanted to celebrate the things about him that so inspired me. I mean, the last session he did that my son Jake produced called to Traveling On, just an incredible mm-hmm. experience. But I also had to tell the story that he revealed to me, which was a story of a very difficult life and in a sense, a story of a soldier coming home and you know, not, early in his life at the age of 21 or something and never really adjusting to civilian society after that and go, what he went through. And I, it's unlike anything I've ever written because in a way it's, 
it expresses a degree of pain at greater length. I mean, I didn't want to, but uh, yeah. but I knew we were going to emerge on the other side, and that's what that's what kept me going. When you're writing about somebody and and you're 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 trying to get to that that elemental truth, you know, the stuff that maybe is difficult to talk about, you know, um, as as a conversationalist, as an interviewer. Are you are you always listening for the little like sort of entryways into that stuff? Because that's not the stuff that someone's going to just immediately start talking about. Hi, Peter. Let's talk about this painful experience. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. h- how do you how do you get to that? Is it impo- is it is it is it the sort of thing where you just have to stay open and listen, or you know, is, or do you have you know skills that you've honed? No, <laughs> no, I, I don't think it's a matter of skills. I think it's a matter of listening. It's a matter of treating the people you are dealing with and you know, that, you, that you're talking to with the respect that they deserve and recognizing their dignity and, it, and having the patience to let the conversation go wherever it goes. I mean, there's not a single, if there are revelations in these uh, chapters or in any of the books, they don't come from my pushing for the revelations. I didn't know what the revelation was going to be. They come from the person wanting to tell me. And I, I think this is true. I mean, you, you know, you could push me to great revelations if you wanted to. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, I think people want to tell their true stories, yeah. but you have to wait around for them. And and one of the things, one of the, I think the next to last chapter in the book is about my father and my grandfather, uh, his father. They're both physicians and the way in which they treated their patients. And as a little kid, I didn't sit around thinking, oh, this is going to be my inspiration. In fact, I don't think until I wrote this book that I really gave it all that much thought. But the example that they set, I mean, it's like it's like with Dr. Fauci. The reason that he can continue to inspire people is because you see his all-out commitment and you see his respect for the, in this case, it's a broad span of people, but for the people to whom he's dedicated. It's not to glorify himself. And that's what I got from my father and grandfather was yeah. just, you know, my grandfather had the most humble uh, office in this tenement in East Boston on the second floor above a pharmacy with a woman named Mrs. Nagel next door who had an apartment. And, you know, with a, uh, a pot-bellied stove in the, uh, uh, in the waiting room. And, you know, it was just, he was about the patients. And so I, I'm not saying that I took what I learned from them. I didn't, you know, but I think I learned by example. And that's from the very first time. I mean, when I forced myself to interview Skip James, just because I, I just so admired him and his music. And I was, how old was I? I mean, I was 21, I think. Uh, and uh, and the questions were idiotic. I mean, my questions, <laughs> I mean, they were kind of pathetic. But the point was, he took me seriously and he gave me answers that were the best that he could give me. He didn't, you know, and he didn't disguise me. And if he hadn't, you know, it still wouldn't have mattered. I was there not to be treated, to put up on a pedestal or anything. I was there to try to get as, learn as much as I could from him and every person that I speak to. But every interview is so different, you know, you say about maintaining enthusiasm. If you have a, if you have a formula for something, why would you go on doing it? If you're going to work every day and it's the same thing every single day or you you're just you know following some kind of a, a i don't know what a, a formula then you know how would you stay interested but you know telling the story of lee smith the novelist lee smith is quite different from telling the story of howlin wolf and yet at the heart of it in some ways their creativity is linked that's and that's what you talk about you say this is a book about creativity mm-hmm. you know and it seems to me like that kind of uh, the willingness to to not have a formula, both artistically, you know, as a writer, you know, yeah, it's it's all it's all linked, right? I mean, this is like a, a, a you know, there's something I I, I do want to go back a little bit to to the very very beginning of your career. Growing up in Massachusetts, you sort of became obsessed with with the blues. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, as I understand it, a, a friend of your brother went to the Newport. Newport Folk Festival. And no, brought- the, brother, the brother of a friend of mine went to okay. that. Okay, the, the older brother. He was he was he was cool. He was really cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so he brought he brought back some blues records, and those were some of the first sort of blues records that you encountered, right? Yeah, I mean, he brought back an assortment of records. I mean, I don't. Joan Baez at that point hadn't made a. She, her first record was on Veritas, I think, and I don't think that had come out yet. But mm-hmm. if it had, he that would have been one of the things that he brought back. Or maybe Odetta, 
and you know, uh, or and some bluegrass and different things. He he had good taste. He was cool, but uh, but among those were some blues records. And this friend of mine, Bob Smith, and I, we just flipped. I mean, it was just it just turned us around. And and you you know you people ask me. You could ask me what was it? Who knows what it was? Yeah. I don't know. But we became you know obsessed. And just committed, and we we started going to these record stores, to Briggs and Briggs and Harvard Square, where they had listen a couple of list, maybe two or three listening booths, and just would listen to these. And you and there were so few albums out at that time. We thought at that time, you know, we were fifteen or say we was probably sixteen by then, and we thought, you know, this is all going to run out pretty soon. You know, we're going to have oh, every sure. blues album. To- <laughs> and you're going to yeah. you're going to exhaust the supply, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I mean, there might have been three or four Lightning Hopkins rec albums, and you'd listen and you'd say, "I want to get the best one," you know, this, which is a terrible attitude. This is like, um, you know, being a prom queen or you know, uh, most likely to succeed in a high school yearbook. I mean, it's like measuring yeah. yourself by your possessions. But right. anyway, so we'd listen, and there would be an album called Lightning Strums the Blues which was, I think, on the score label and had this white hand checked, lumberjack checked shirt, this white hand on this ridiculous looking guitar. But it was an incredible album. I mean, I, years later, I found out it was among his, it, it included among his first recordings. Mm-hmm. But it was Katie May and my California and the shotgun. And it was just sensa- a short haired woman. And it was just sensational. And so we listened to that. And there's another album called Last of the Great Blues Singers. Uh, and You'd have those, and and then Lightning Hopkins was booked to play Harvard, and I I always think it was Adams House, but I don't think it was. I think it was some other house. And going to see Lightning Hopkins at Harvard, what a ridiculous thing to do! But that was all that was available at that time, or all that we imagined was available. And to see somebody that you had been listening to and pouring over their music and trying to decipher the words, and then to to see him at call it Adams House in Harvard, it was such a thrill. And, uh, you know, to this day, it would remain a thrill. I mean, it's not, you know, it can still be a thrill. Right, right. You you discovered uh, English blues magazines, like uh, <laughs> like Blues Unlimited and, and Blues World in the early 60s. And, and I've, I've never come across any copies of these, so I don't, I don't really know exactly what they, you know, were like. But, but I'm curious, uh, wh- where did you come across those magazines? Was that also at the record store? No, no, they, they weren't available at all in this kind of, I mean, I've been trying to find a library that wants to, uh, a collection of Blues Unlimited and Blues World, and nobody's interested because, you know, everybody's gone paperless. But uh, no, you couldn't find it. I, I read uh, in a column by Nat Hentoff, who was somebody whose writing I admired, was, whose passion and commitment I admired most of all, yeah. and about jazz. It wasn't about blues, but it could touch on blues. And he mentioned just in a footnote in this column in The Reporter about this magazine called Blues Unlimited, the first blues magazine that had been. And that, and they gave the address, which was somewhere Bex, 30, like 34 Bexhill on Sea. I can't remember what it was. It was in the town of Bexhill on Sea. And so I wrote to them. And this must have been, you know, let's say in 63 or 64. And I started on this correspondence with Mike Ledbetter and Simon Napier, who had started and who just did an unbelievable job of researching the music at a time when it seemed like nobody in this country was doing that kind of thing. There may have been people, but, but yeah. So I had this long correspondence with them um, and sent in my check and never got a copy of the magazine. So I was like, you, I was still in the dark. And when I called <laughs> up Dick Waterman, who managed Skip James in 65 uh, and just you know, with my heart in my mouth. And uh, I knew Dick, I didn't know Dick well. Dick became a, one, a great friend, but at that time he was just another cool guy who, you know, when he went to a, a Club 47 or uh, Golden Vanity or something, he was the guy at the front, He, you know, he just walked in. Yeah. Uh, so he was managing Skip James and I called him up and this was, you know, after my, this correspondence I'd had with the Blues Unlimited editors and stuff and I called him up and I said, you know, I. I want to interview Skip James because I want to do an, a, an article for Blues Unlimited. And there was this pause, and, and Dick stuttered a little at that time. He doesn't anymore. But he, he said, hmm, that's interesting. You know, they just did a three-part series. I'm surprised they want to do that. So I quickly recouped and regrouped. And eventually, I, uh, I mean, I did the interview. I wrote it up within a couple of days. And I think w- within six months or a year or so, I had contacted Bob Groom, who uh, was the editor of Blues World, the second blues mag- magazine in England, 
and uh, Nutzford, Cheshire. And uh, he um, and he published it. That's it was, incredible. It, yeah, yeah, and, and 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 that was sort of how you you got started. So a, a couple years later, uh, the uh, the sort of underground music press began, mm-hmm. right? Uh, right. Uh, stuff like you know Crawdaddy, Rolling Stone, uh, which yeah, you, well, pre, pre Rolling Stone, really. Well, we're probably that, a year or two ahead of Rolling Stone, but yes, Rolling Stone was part of that whole wave, absolutely. Sure, sure. At that time. You know, so you'd written for these, you know, these British blues mags. You know, there were starting to be some American, you know, magazines about music. Um, You know, did you get the sense at all in those days that you were sort of charting new territory or or part of the invention of this this form? You know, music journalism, rock criticism, that sort of stuff. No? No, no. I just was so head over heels about blues and I was just going to follow my enthusiasm, my passion, wherever it took me. And, and I didn't have any sense. What, what I was looking for was the opportunity to exhort people about the musicians I cared about so much. So, I mean, to take two examples, when Crawdaddy started up in 66 or 67, I don't remember, this kid I knew, Paul Williams, uh, who was a little younger than I was, he got in touch with me. He actually... I ran into him at Club 47, and he was going to interview Howlin' Wolf. I, I don't remember what the order of this was. And he was he said, I don't know anything about blues. Would you help me out? And, and so I did. And I still have some, I feel badly because I, right after we interviewed him, I said, you've got to send me a tape. You've got to send me a tape. He said, I will, I will. But then the tape just disappeared into the, <laughs> so I had my memories of it. But, but the point was, he asked me, Paul Williams asked me if I would like to write for Crawdaddy. And we were just somebody I knew. And Crawdaddy was essentially, you know, its focus was primarily psychedelic rock, let's say. It was more San Francisco rock, Moby Grape and Jefferson Airplane, and, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, Grateful Dead. Uh, music, uh, music that was deeply connected to the idea of the totally blues, connected. you know, immersed, but sure, yeah, yeah, sort of a second generation or third generation, however you'd put it, yeah. But it appeared on the surface to be very different. And I, I just didn't have any interest in that. And I said, sure, I'd love to write. But what I want to write about is Skip James, because he, he published that, too. I want to, or he published another thing. I, wrote. I want to write about Robert Reed Williams. I want to write, write about Howlin' Wolf mm-hmm. and he, and, and, or Buddy Guy. And he said, oh, sure, go ahead. Write whatever you want. So there was my lone story. Yeah, about blues singers, either obscure or not so obscure, like the buddy, buddy guy may not have been that obscure, although he wasn't that famous within the majoritarian society. But um, and so I just wrote my stories for that. And the same thing at the Boston Phoenix, which was slightly different, that got started up as essentially an ad magnet. The guy who started was a, was a student at the business school, and he uh, realized that there was no outlet for entertainment. Uh, advertising. The mainstream papers didn't cover the clubs that, and didn't, or maybe they were too expensive, but they were not, there were no advertisements. You, how do you follow what's going on around town? So he started this essentially as an ad uh, magazine, but then he needed some content. And then a friend of mine became the, the um, he was a drama critic. And he asked me, he said, how would you like to write about music? And again, my stipulation was great. Muddy Waters, James Brown, Alan Paul, <laughs> yeah. Lewis. As long as it's about blues, yeah. 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 And they didn't care. You know, it just, they just needed, and, but, but the only thing you could write were previews. There was no, there wasn't space enough to write reviews. And besides, I didn't want to write reviews because I wanted to bring people to the shows. Mm-hmm. So one of the first things I wrote was about James Brown. And I had seen James Brown, you know, two or three times at that point. And I just described the James Brown show as the greatest dramatic experience you'll ever have. I mean, forget about happenings, which were the big thing then, you know, uh, which were kind of improvisational plays with mm-hmm. audience participation. So forget about that. James Brown exceeds it all. And I tried to describe what the James Brown show was like and hoping to, you know, not to educate people, to bring them out to see the show. Same with Howlin' Wolf or Muddy Waters. Yeah, to to get people involved in this experiential thing that you were that mm-hmm. you were you know uh, that you were so so interested in well, were you were you reading as the underground you know music press sort of bloomed did you did you read a lot of your contemporaries did you read your peers people like uh, I don't know I guess Chris Gow or Ellen Willis or or people like that were you were you sort of like checking out what other folks were doing or did you feel like you were off on your own trip a little bit. 
Well, I wouldn't be so egotistical as to, you know, <laughs> say, I, or what do you call it when the world revolves around solipsistic, you know? Right. It wasn't that I was saying, hey, I, I, you know, I am the truth and these people, it wasn't that at all. <laughs> but what they wrote about in many cases just didn't interest me that much. Yeah. And I, again, was pursuing my own thing. And also a lot of the expression at that time, uh, the, um, and maybe any time, it had to do with sort of um, calling attention to the writer. I mean, the whole thing about the new journalism, uh, I mean, which. Yeah, jumped, absolutely. Yeah. And that was one thing. And the other thing was, you know, using language, which was, you know, current at the time, you know, groovy or out of sight or, you know, I mean, I'm, these are bad. I never can think of the good examples. And I just didn't want to do that. I had no interest in doing that at all. And, the, you know, a writer that I admired at the time was Stanley Booth because he wrote in an almost classical fashion. Yeah. And, his, uh, he, and then when he published his, well, how I became aware of him is he published a story in Esquire called a, Man, a Hound Dog to the Manor Born about Elvis. And I'm thinking, one, it was so cool that it was about Elvis. And two, it was an Esquire. And then right. he wrote another article about Furry Lewis uh, and described him sweeping the streets in Memphis, the blues singer Furry Lewis. And that was in Playboy. But the way that he wrote uh, addressed the subject in a language that was suitable to the subject. It wasn't elevated. It wasn't highfalutin. But it was almost classically spare and gave great space, uh, accorded great dignity to the way in which people spoke. Mm -hmm. And those were the two, th two things. But probably, the, and I've thought about this uh, recently because just from being interviewed, and the writer that I think may have influenced me the most even though he didn't write about the music that I uh, was so committed to, was Whitney Ballet, who wrote about jazz in The uh, New Yorker. Mm. And again, his style may have been a little fancier and more New Yorkerly ironic than what I wanted to do. But again, if he was writing about Thelonious Monk or Charles Mingus, he wrote about them as great artists, not as people who are operating on a kind of lower scale or, you know, Right. Was, Dwight McDonald wrote a book about mid, oh, I can't, you know, it's like the whole, the whole thing of high culture, mid, mid culture, low culture. Right. That just didn't, I mean, Whitney Valley had treated Duke Ellington or Charles Mingus or Monk as great artists. And that's how I wanted to treat, even though the people that I was writing about were, were doing some may have appeared to be less sophisticated. They, they were certainly less educated than than Mingus or Monk, but to me, they were no less, of no less consequence. And of no less, I mean, somebody, I mean, people always, you know, people always sort of worry about whether you're getting sort of too much above your raising or, you know, you're being pretentious and doing this. Right. And I know right. in, in the new book and uh, looking to get lost, I mentioned, I say something about, you know, Merle Haggard should have, you know, you should have gotten a Nobel Prize. Or, and, and somebody wrote, and, this is outrageous. How could anybody say that? But, you know, this is a great, great songwriter. A great, if we're going to recognize songwriters, he deserved it just like Chuck Berry and, and like Bob Dylan. He deserved every recognition well, you can get. Yeah, I mean, no kidding. No kidding. And I think that that, that, uh, that zeal you bring, that respect you bring for the music, you know, that's so so powerful throughout this book you know you talk about ray charles you know ray charles is such an incredible uh figure and i think in this book it, it opens up something so so interesting you talk about the song i got a woman which is obviously uh, uh blew the doors wide open you know uh for him professionally uh inspired so many others became this massive thing you kind of trace the 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 roots of that song uh back to a gospel song that he uh, that he knew it must be Jesus right I, I I I thought a lot about as I read through this book um the sort of like undergirding of these great artists that you're so interested in and and mm -hmm. what maybe drives them a little bit and I think what you seem to be maybe drawn to without completely giving yourself over to the language that's normally associated with it is almost this sense of deep religiosity or mysticism. You know, uh, I think that that's an undercurrent that I'm really, really interested in. Uh, you know, do you feel like um, like that is sort of what you're talking about very often with these artists? Is that sort of 
transcendent, sublime thing that happens when music simply, uh, when music simply uh, conveys the unconveyable. I'm sorry that I'm so, yeah. I'm fumbling yeah, yeah. for it. No, no, I agree. I mean, because we're all fumbling around in the dark. I was going to say fumble before you did, <laughs> but we're all fumbling around the dark and we're looking for something. And I'm not looking for an answer per se. I'm looking for an illumination, I guess. And that's what I, I mean, you feel like, uh, uh, you know, you asked about maintaining enthusiasm. Well, I, this is related. It isn't quite the enthusiasm part, but it's the idea is somehow or other that by immersing myself completely in what I'm doing, whether it's Elvis or Sam Cooke, or Sam Phillips, or you know Dick Curlis, or whoever. That as I get into it deeper and deeper, at some point something's going to click, and I'm going to be gone. Yeah. And that's what generally that's what generally happens as I develop. I'm I'm working on a new project now, and it's the same kind of thing. You're just looking all around. I mean, you're trying to take it all in, and you don't want it to snap into place in the sense that. Uh, then you have this formulaic approach. Oh, okay, then it's one, two, three, four, because it never is. But somehow you're there and you're able to write a story from the inside out. Now, in the case of Ray Charles, I had interviewed him uh, for Sweet Soul Music, which came out in 86. Mm -hmm. And But I'd also done it, I mean, one way of, you know, you have to figure out how you can do these things. And the only way I could, you know, get the money to go out to interview him in Los Angeles and stuff was to sell the idea of doing a profile. And I did, I did an extensive profile on him and uh, which ran in many, uh, a friend of mine formed a sort of syndication service just for that story. And we published it in a lot of places. Yeah, And it also was one of the underpinnings of Sweet Soul Music because he and Sam Cooke, uh, you know, revolutionized the approach to R&B by bringing this gospel influence to it. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to do in writing the chapter for this book was to bring to bear, not to present a profile, but to try to think how this moment where he discovered his own voice occurred and how much he needed that voice in order to be able to express his music the way he wanted to. He needed to have a band of his own. He needed to create essentially a Ray Charles identity, not just an identity of someone who loved music and was influenced by Aldi, by Charles Brown and Tchaikovsky and, you know, all these different influences. And that, right. so I, I, I recast the story i used i stumbled across the source that the uh, that i got a woman came from it must be jesus by the southern tones in writing uh the sam cook biography because i was talking to these gospel people it doesn't i'm not going to tell the whole story but the point was <laughs> it was totally uh it had to do with the first guitarist for the soul stars who died shortly after he joined it and i was re i was trying to find out who is this guy and then some of the gospel people said, oh, he played for this group, the Southern Tones. He says, you know, and they said, yeah, I don't know, they had some kind of a song like I Got a Woman. I don't know if it was before or after. And then it was hard to find the song because the Internet didn't exist as it does now. And eventually I found the song. And, oh, my God, it's exactly the same. And it came out one month or two months before. Not that he recorded I Got a Woman before he actually hit on the idea for it. So I had that. But it it. He, this was the way that he found his voice. It freed him up. It gave him, and, and it led him to this kind of exaltation, the sense of ex exaltation, but also the whole sense that he had, just like Merle Haggard, of having a band that could express what was in his mind, that could play the music that he heard in his mind. So, it, But, but in, just to go briefly, in writing the story of Lee Smith, and again, I, you, I have no idea what I'm start that this is where it's going to that I'm, this is anything you're going to find out yeah. but so she described how she was sort of f not floundering she was casting about for a voice and she was writing all these kind of made up stories and then Eudora Welty ap appeared at the college she went to uh, in I think in Virginia and how all of a sudden she read and Eudora Welty either read or she read a story about baking a cake and all of a sudden she realized that her voice was the voice that was inside her, the voice in the sense she had been stifling up till then. And that was, was where she came from and who she was that gave her the, the, the uh, you know, the, the um, force for what she wanted to write. So it's in, in each That's case, right. I, but I think it's absolutely reaching one of the most uh, dramatic aspects of that was going to the uh, session where Dick Curlis recorded his last album, Traveling Through and hanging around there uh, 
and just watching the tone of everybody being elevated by Dick's vision and right. the musicians being so caught up in the recording of the music and his the spell that he wove that they would lose their place in the middle of the song. And that sounds crazy. I mean, it sounds like fanciful almost, I, you, you know, like Peter, you're just giving an example. That's, that's metaphorical. But I went back, I mean, I witnessed it and I went back and talked to the musician. Right. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's this personal thread that runs through the entirety of the book. And I think that that's the sort of thing that you're talking about there, which is that, you know, um, when I was when I very first started writing about music, I do think somebody um, I got some advice from an editor who told me, he said, don't write about uh, the music, write about the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I remember being like, uh, music is holy to me. Music is the most empower, the most important thing in the world, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in, to me. So I was like, well, I gotta write about the music, man. Who cares yeah. about the people? And he was like, well, the people make the music, though. So if you can get to the heart of that, you know, um, and so that's always stuck with me, you know. But I think about how you talk about. Um, God. At one point, you know, you, you quote Sam Phillips in the book, and I'd read this quote before, but he says about Howlin' Wolf, you know, about Howlin' Wolf's voice, um, that uh, he said, this is where the soul of a man never dies, you know, right, like th right. th that this what that's what this is. And so I guess what I mean to what, where I'm where I'm trying to go with this is is to ask you, you know, uh, you know, the it, the singer or the song, you know, is there, wh wh where do the lines get drawn? And is there any point in drawing those lines? You know what I mean? Where the, where the music starts and the person ends. Well, I think the person in terms of all their uh, idiosyncrasies and uh, quiddities and oddities and stuff, I, I don't know that that in particular, I mean, you run into somebody, let's say somebody like Merle Haggard, whom I admired the hell out of and, and you know, loved in a way, but I, I wouldn't use his behavior as a, as a model for, you know, <laughs> for, for anybody else. <laughs> well, well, uh, well, sure, yeah, yeah. But but the point is, for, 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 there are two things to, to, about this. One is that, for me, the two are, are inextricably bound up. The person mm -hmm. who is making the music, where the music comes from, and what music comes out. And by that, I, I mean, I guess I mean, I'm looking at, for the interior of the person. I don't care particularly, you know, if somebody is a drug addict, if they, you know, are, are an alcoholic. I, it doesn't make any difference. I, I've hung around with a lot of different kinds of people. What I'm interested in is who the person is inside. And if they're doing, if their behavior is self-destructive, then I feel bad about it. Uh, but, you know, Ray Charles was a junkie from the time he was very young, and the greatest music he ever made was the music he made while he was strung out. And, you know, you can look for object lessons, you can look for moral, you know, fables and stuff, but you can't deny that. And so it has nothing to do with, with anything other than to describe what is, from my point of view. But the other thing is that my only way in, I mean, was, I mean, and I realized this was like finding my voice, was through the people I was writing about. I'm not a musician. Um, I don't know that it's, you know, that, that it's a particularly useful thing. I do know people who can write about music. Bob Palmer, for instance, of the New York Times. I mean, we, I mean, wrote Deep Blues. And uh, mm -hmm. he was really well enough acquainted that he could write with far great, in far greater detail about the music than I could, and just as passionately. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I have a lim that limitation. And so my way in was through the musician. And then my intent, my hope, and my intention in describing the music was to lose myself in what I heard. Yeah. And so what I'm writing is not technical, but I hope it's accurate and I hope it's evocative and I hope it's passionate. Yeah. But, it, yeah. but it, couldn't, it couldn't stand, because of my own limitations, it couldn't stand on its own. But also I think that in the sense that people are, I mean, E.M. Forster wrote about this in aspects of the novel, that people always are looking for a story. They want to know what happens next. And so to tie in, uh, for example, who was somebody like Howlin' Wolf, who in the army uh, was dismissed from the army, essentially as a psychotic, which he wasn't at all. I mean, he was brutalized. Right. He was, he was, uh, there, there were men, and he wasn't suited to it. He, he had never left the farm. He was in, I think he was 30, over 30 years old when he entered the army and it didn't work out. But that what it, but the experience for him was so scarring, even though uh, he, uh, 
you know, he said to me when I first met him, I, I'm thinking, oh, the army must have opened up the world for you, you know, and, and it seemed as if he had gone to Europe because it was during the Second World War and he hadn't, although he didn't say he hadn't. But he, I said, well, so how was, what was the experience? He says, man, they practically drilled you to death. I almost lost my mind. That's as direct a, you know, a, a reference as, as uh, you know, as I ever ran across until the Howlin' Wolf biography came out a few years ago in which they documented uh, what his experience in the Army had been. But in the Sam Phillips biography, I talk about how Sam Phillips, who had gone through two rounds of electroshock treatment, one when he was 21 and one just as he was beginning to achieve success with uh, Ike Turner with Rocket 88, mm -hmm. and chose to do it, researched it, did it when it was huge, highly experimental, and many people were just left vegetables, really. And he had the courage to do that. And Howlin' Wolf was the most, he always said was the most profound. He and Char he said Howlin' Wolf and Charlie Rich were the two most profound artists he ever worked with. Two more different artists you could never find. And yet he, sure. but but I, I felt in writing the biography, I had the privilege of knowing what each of their experiences was. And I felt like in writing about it, that even though neither of them ever talked about it, they must have sensed that that shared uh, feeling of not, not just of exclusion, but just of uh, of lostness, and uh, not in a good sense, but just just of being overwhelmed. And I felt like that was one of the things that that enabled them to uh, to work so effectively together and to respect each other to such a degree. One of the things that I find very very uh, fascinating about this book is when you write about Robert Johnson, you write about the transformative nature of art and mm -hmm. you kind of get into this idea of discovery. Um, and you suggest that even if something goes unremarked on, uh, or neglected for decades or even longer, I mean, you cite John Donne, you know, who's like a, right. a 17th century mystic poet, you know, whose work wasn't really nobody gave a shit until maybe the 1920s, you know, at least yeah, that, yeah. you know, that, that we're aware of. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think, you know, d I'm curious, do you believe that a great song or a great work of art will eventually find its audience, uh, sort of no matter what? I do. I do. Although for, for example, if we're talking about it's being re recorded by history or something, if you look at, um, blues to take a, <laughs> a simple example. Some of the greatest blues singers undoubtedly were not recorded. They came too early or they just weren't discovered. Right. But their work continued to live on in the work and in the influence uh, that their work had on those who followed. Now, there's a revisionist school of history now or, uh, that suggests that too much um, you know, too much uh, impact is put on Robert Johnson that, you know, after all, he didn't sell that many records when he was alive. And it's really just white collectors who made him into a kind of demigod and that kind of thing. But I think, you know, had his records all been destroyed, his, his genius and his recordings and his compositions f were such a huge influence and a, a documented influence on the work of Muddy Waters, of Elmore James, of Sonny Boy Williams, and of Robert Jr. Lockwood, of Baby Boy Warren, of all of Johnny Shines, they were carrying on. And then you have, you know, let's say the Rolling Stones and Eric Clapton and stuff. If, you know, if everything else had disappeared, the music was still there. And right. if nobody had ever rediscovered Robert Johnson, the music was still there and the music would have continued to have its impact. And, and, that, or Charlie Patton, who's a, you know a less well known. I mean, they he's referred to him as the founder of the Delta Blues. He you know was a great inspiration to Sun House, Robert Johnson. But again, his music has just persisted through the years. And if you consider someone like Howlin' Wolf is an icon today, even had a postage stamp for himself. So much of what he did came directly from Charlie Patton, as he attested over and over again. So you wouldn't need the Charlie Patton recordings. To, to for the music to have survived or to recognize his influence. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's all it's all part of this chain, this chain of mm -hmm. of you know, of influence and and appreciation. Um, you know, one of the the you brought up sort of the the white blues collector thing, and and I think that right now we're having uh, an interesting we're, we have an interesting chance to to talk a little bit about. 
uh, race in our country and and yeah. certain certain dividing lines. And I think about how the record industry is such a uh, it's it's like a microcosm of maybe the overall situation, right? Where even the terms that were devised in terms of genre. Uh, you know, sort of had like a, a marketing spin, which was we're going to market this to white audiences, this to black audiences, or well, or whatever. Don't, don't don't forget that you know the race uh, black the, those that were targeted for black audiences were called race music, right? Race uh, records, but, right? But, yeah, right. But those that were targeted for white country audiences were called hillbilly music, which which was also a huge insult. It was a I'd say one of the things people don't, uh, I mean, now people embrace it, but you know, that's, but, and, and eventually, and actually within the uh, African American world to be a race man was a compliment. This was, you were for the race for many years. But I think one of the things that has to be understood, and we can see it today, we can see it this very day, is the extent to which so many things are class based. So that let's let's take for an example robert johnson's recordings uh in um, 1937 and 38 in san antonio and dallas i would defy you to or i would expect that if you looked at the contracts which were uh which the hillbilly performers and the mexican performers who recorded at those same sessions not with robert johnson but they were you know i would doubt very much there's any distinction between uh, the contracts which the hillbilly performers had and the blues performers had. And the only, and the thing, what, all, what that means is that you have a class-based society in which you have a capitalist model and the capitalist model is simply has nothing to do with giving uh, people their just share, you know, their just due. And in fact, in many ways, it's set up not to do that. And the, the, the music industry the basis for the music industry goes back to the late 19th century when the song publishing rules, which continue to this day, the same things, were first established in Europe. And um, and they give everything to the person who owns the song, mm -hmm. everything to the person who owns the copyright, which is not the, the songwriter, it's the publisher. And the same problems that you have, you know, you had in the 30s, you have today, and but they apply to people who come from backgrounds where they're not as sophisticated in their ability to read a contract, let's say, why should they be? But nobody's nobody's looking to give the person who comes in, you know, handicapped by a lack of education or, or just sophistication, nobody's looking to give them a break. And the system no, is set up essentially to, to screw them. So That's I, I would say people should be, you know, Black Lives Matter is something to be totally supported, but also, People should be looking at the basis for capitalism if they're concerned about injustice and inequality. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I do think that it's such an interesting thing that, you know, uh, and a lot of the artists in this book uh, have um, adversarial relationships with their record labels, you know, or oh, yeah. with the suits, you know. Um, I think that there's something that is to me so interesting and compelling and captivating about music, which is the way, and I guess this is true of all art, you know, but it's the way that it sort of dispenses with so much of that stuff that we're talking about, you know, like I know people got screwed by their record contracts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but you listen to the song and you know that they were experiencing a moment of, of just like, unrestrained joy and power in that in that well, moment you know yeah. and it's like no matter how bad uh, the system that you know keeps them from things that they should have you know uh, compensation for this work and and all this other stuff but it's just that like it's such a human need to 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 make things to 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 create you know yeah. and yeah. and i feel like uh we put up with, or, or not we, you know, I'm, I'm not as screwed by the music industry as a single artist, but obviously, you know, you, you just, you, you, you deal with the, the systems, no matter how bad they are, because the thing at the core of it is just so integral to human existence, you know, and I find that just so fascinating. I feel like that comes through in, the, in this book a lot, and you have these people who are willing to, to fight those fights, you know, uh, because they have to make this stuff. And then you have some people like Sam Cooke or Ray Charles and uh, 
there are other examples, uh, but uh, sometimes they come to me, sometimes they don't, but they w who actually carved out their own niche or niche and, and became self, uh, you know, standalone. And and were and controlled their own music and stuff, but that's unusual, and it, and it's and it's still unusual to a degree. So it, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that one of the things that's always stuck with me was uh, when I asked Muddy Waters when I first met him in 1970, and he'd been in a terrible automobile wreck, which was uh, which allowed me to go out and see him. He was stuck at home for the first time in years and years, and I would go out to his house on the south side and talk to him, and I asked him towards the end of our conversation, you know, if there was anything that disappointed him or what disappointed him most, he says, yeah, he says, I'm disappointed that, you know, I wasn't discovered sooner when I was younger and I could put out more. And it didn't have to do with, I'm disappointed that I didn't make more money. Although in the end, he did make more money eventually. Yeah. He didn't get his just due, but he did get, you know, but, but it was really the idea that I'm in this all the way. And that's one of the things that struck me about everybody that everybody I've ever written about. I feel like they're conscious, creative artists. They are people, they have a work ethic. They're just, they're committed to what they do. It's not accidental that, you know, whatever obstacles are thrown in their way. And I'm not in any way excusing those obstacles, but whatever obstacles are thrown in their way, they are determined to forge ahead. Uh, and the other thing that really struck me, which is, and again, this was came out of, in writing this new book, Looking to Get Lost, was the democratic views that all of them have espoused with nothing to do with politics. I'm not going to get into <laughs> how each person felt about politics. I mean, Johnny Shines was the one person who was committed to a rat that I knew were committed to a well thought out radical form of politics, a progressive sure. form. But it, it, hadn't, it wasn't to do, it doesn't have anything to do with politics. It has to do with the degree to which they, every one of them, heard music or hears music with ears all around their head, as Sam Phillips said, without regard to categories, without distinctions, without anything. So you have somebody like Howlin' Wolf, you know, the purest of African-American blues singers, attributed uh, one of his greatest influences to be Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music, and describing eloquently how Jimmy Rogers, how he met Jimmy Rogers and how Jimmy Rogers showed when he was 13, 14 years old, and Jimmy Rogers taught him how to yodel, which was uh, Jimmy Rogers' mark. Or you have someone like Bobby Blue Bland, who cites uh, the influence of Aretha Franklin's father, Reverend C.L. Franklin, his sermons, uh, When the Eagle Stirs Her Nest, as being the source of his squall. So, okay, that's not surprising. Right. But then he describes how Perry Como was a great source of inspiration for the smoothness of his. And then he describes how he would listen to the Grand Old Opry every Saturday night and how the country songs, the way they told the story were. So th there's no, there are no distinctions there. There's no, I wouldn't listen to this because of that. And when I, you know, you brought up Ray Charles. Uh, I'll never forget when I was interviewing him, you know, I spent close to a week with him, I think. It was really great. I mean, not living with him, just <laughs> going back every day. And uh, and I asked him what he listened to. And he says, man, he says, I love those Jackie Gleason Presents albums, which were at that time, I think they were like supermarket kinds of things. And I almost laughed because sure. I, thought he, I thought he was putting me on. And But thank God I didn't laugh or he, that he cut in. He, man, I love the sweet sound of Bat Bobby Hackett's trumpet. And I thought at the time, and I, I haven't lived up to this, but I thought, you know, he is so much less prejudiced than I am in terms of what he listens to. That's and right. He could just listen to it and he's serious about it and he could hear that. And I set it as my goal to achieve an equally democratic perspective, but I never did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you got pretty, pretty, pretty darn close. Uh, this is a great book and it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to speak with you today, Peter. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, it's really, it's been, it's really been fun. I've really, I've really enjoyed it. And, uh, I, it, it just was in, you know, I enjoyed the di different directions we went in and, you know, as, as I, during the brief time when I taught creative writing at Vanderbilt, I would always tell the students and said, prize the digression. So I hope I succeeded. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Peter, thanks so much. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. And, uh, again, thank you. And, uh, thanks for this great book and uh, a lifetime of, of great writing and, uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Well, thanks. I really, I really have enjoyed it.
so much for tuning in. I'm Jason P. Woodbury. I write, host, and produce transmissions. Our audio is edited by Andrew Horton. Graphic designed by Sarah Goldstein. Video assets created by Jonathan Mark Walls. And our executive producer is Aquarium Drunker founder, Justin Gage. We'll be back next week with a new conversation. I'll be joined by another music writer I admire very much, Amanda Petrusich of The New Yorker and a couple great books. I'm going to get into all of that. So stay safe until then, and we'll uh, catch you here next week on the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast. Thanks for listening.